So welcome to the people in the room and those of you online and our podcast listeners who are listening while they're working out or driving or doing something else. We're glad to have you. And this is lesson number five in our theology course. Let's pray and we'll go ahead and get started. Lord, you are the author of all truth. You are all truth and you lead us into all truth. And we just thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who has been sent to lead us into truth. And we invite him to lead us into truth tonight that you direct my speech, you direct our thoughts, and you help us to learn from your word through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we saw last week, Lord, we need to be born again and we need to be spirit-filled to correctly hear your word and understand it. So we ask the Holy Spirit to fill us now. And we ask these things in his beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're on page 21 of Bibliology, and as we continue in the subcategory of hermeneutics, which is Bible interpretation, and I just want to review the two mandatory conditions that we have. Someone want to shout out the first one? Shout it out. You must be born again. That's right. We'll get some participation. I, we heard you online. Good job. Okay, you must be born again, and the second one? He must be spirit-filled. So we saw that the natural man does not understand the things of the word, and the carnal man, the man who is not filled with the Holy Spirit or woman, doesn't understand them either. And we saw that we can know, uh, we saw how to be spirit-filled, desire, ask, yield. We desire to have the Holy Spirit fill us. We ask him and we yield. But how do you really know if you are spirit-filled? Uh, scripture tells us, and I, I don't think we talked about this, so let me just add a little bit. Galatians chapter 5 tells us how to know if we're spirit-filled. And there are a lot of people who think spirit-filled means you can have some kind of experience or emotion or et cetera, et cetera. And that might be true, but it's not always true. Every emotion isn't the Holy Spirit, and every ecstatic utterance isn't the Holy Spirit. So the Scriptures give us a way we can know if we're spirit-filled or filled with our own sinful flesh. And that's in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19. The Apostle Paul lets us know. Um, and he says in verse 19 of Galatians 5, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. So he says the works of the person who's fleshly, who's not spirit-filled, who's carnally minded, it's obvious. And he says, he goes on to say, um, it's evident. And then he says, they are immorality. Well, if you're involved in immorality, you're not a spirit-filled person impurity so if you're doing something that's impure unholy sensuality okay um, these things are not of the holy spirit and then he mentions idolatry sorcery enmities which are hatred strife that's being quarrelsome jealousy outbursts of anger disputes dissensions or divisions factions envies, drunkenness carousings and if we got through the list you go phew i wasn't on it and he goes, and things like these. <laughs> so, ah, okay. Of which I forewarn you, just I forewarn you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These types of things are not part of the kingdom of God. When we get in the kingdom of God, these things are not part of that kingdom. And they're not part of a spirit-filled person's life. So I remember some time ago, I told some people in the church, the problem with you is you're carnal. They didn't appreciate it very well because they were leaders in the church. But I wasn't looking at their heart. I was looking at the list of things, and it just sounded like them. Um, but then he says in verse 22, but, by contrast, but, one of my favorite words, it changes everything, the fruit of the Spirit. So this is what the Holy Spirit produces in you. You don't produce it. Holy Spirit produces it. He produces the fruit. The fruit is, and notice the word fruit is singular, so it's not a list of fruits. It's one fruit that has all these different facets. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So these are evidences that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting. The list is not a list of gifts. It's a list of fruit. So you can have the gift of preaching or teaching or tongue speaking or healing and not be filled with the Holy Spirit. You go, well, how can that be? Well, I can preach a sermon in the flesh. My gift doesn't go away just because I'm not spirit-filled. You've been given a spiritual gift, but you can misuse it. And so you need to make sure you not only have a spiritual gift, which is a spiritual ability to do something for God's kingdom, but you need to do it in this power of the Holy Spirit. 
So we've digressed. We're going backwards in this class. Isn't that great? Okay. So I just thought you'd like to know, um, that's how you know if you're spirit-filled, according to Galatians 5. Okay, then we started looking at five mandatory contexts that we want to look at. And we looked at the first three of those. And oh, but before that, we did mention, that's right, that um, when you come to hermeneutics, there are two basic approaches. There's the approach that is called the historical grammatical method. In other words, you look how the words were used historically and grammatically. It's often called the, the literal method. And then there's a the method that uses literal but adds allegorical to it as well. And some people prefer the word spiritual. So a literal translation is a translation that if there's a metaphor, you understand it has, it's a metaphor, but it has a literal understanding. So when Jesus says he's the door, and you take that literally, you don't think that he's got hinges and a doorknob and he's made of wood. You just think that he's the entrance. He's the way to enter something. So you're taking the meaning literally, even though it's a metaphor or figure of speech. Um, that's the literal method of interpreting things. You don't look for hidden meanings unless it's clear that it's some type of metaphor or idiom or even allegory that's being used. Um, the other method that's used, though, is to look for what might be called hidden meanings or other meanings. So when it says that Christ is going to reign on earth for a thousand years, they don't take that literally. They say, well, that's metaphorically or spiritually or allegorically. A thousand years means he's going to reign for a long time, and on earth he's reigning now in your heart. And so that's a little bit different way of interpreting things, and that will change which way you go. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, in the next section. So when we come to the five mandatory contexts, this is a way of interpreting scripture literally. And we first look at the individual words. And as we saw, a brick building is made up of bricks and the building is only as strong as the bricks that make it up. Those are the words. And we saw that words make a difference because if you have a word that means take away or means lift up, the same word for a vine, it's important to know in context which way it's being used. The word is important. So examine the individual words. We then looked at the examining the immediate context, the verses right before and right after. And we talked about Matthew 18, 19, and 20, a passage that many of us have heard and probably used incorrectly, where it says where two or three are gathered, um, there I am in your midst, and we use it for prayer meeting that we need two or three people to come together and pray. But the context, as we see in the verses before and after, is church discipline. And he's saying that when we get together to discipline someone who's in sin, and we bring two or three witnesses, which was the requirement of the Old Testament when you were judging someone, he says, I'm with you. You have my authority to make decisions over this church discipline situation. So that's the context. The third thing we looked at was examine the book context. And Sometimes you need to understand the entire book. And we looked at Ecclesiastes 10:19, and I humorously say that that's my life verse, where it says, money is the answer to everything. And so if you ask somebody, does the Bible say money is the answer to everything? It does. But it's not saying that that's a good thing. And when you study the book of Ecclesiastes, you realize it's sort of the, um, well, it is the autobiography of a man, King Solomon, who lived by the world's philosophy. And so he writes a book that talks about how he lived his life. And he lived a life that said, wine makes, a life, wine makes you know, the heart merry, and, and money is the answer to everything. And that's how he lived his life. But he gets to the end of the book, and he says the conclusion is, you need to listen to God and follow his word, because you're going to be judged. So you have to understand the whole book. And we didn't look at Galatians 5, 2 to 4, but I'll just mention it to you. In Galatians 5, 2 to 4, the Apostle Paul says, if you're circumcised, then Christ is of no benefit to you. It's like, whoa. <laughs> you know, we won't ask anybody in this room if they've been circumcised or not. But in the context, you're going, well, what does he mean by that? Well, he was speaking in the book to people in Galatia who were trying to add Old Testament laws to New Testament faith in Jesus Christ. So they were telling people, well, you can believe in Jesus Christ and be saved, but you also have to be circumcised. And they go, what does that mean? Whoa, I don't want to join your church. You know, and so they're adding these regulations. And he says, if you add human works to your faith, your faith is of none avail. It's worthless because salvation is not faith plus works. Faith, it's based on faith. 
you know? And so you can't have faith plus works. It's not you believe and you do these things. And so in Galatians 5, that's what he's speaking to, but you need to understand the context of the book and who he's writing to. So then we come to the next context and kind of like the target here, we're moving out. We come to number four and number four on your, on your notes there is we look at the Bible context. It's Bible context. Examine, thank you. Examine the Bible context. So what do we mean by that? Well, before I show you what we mean by that, let me show you why this is so important. If you have your Bibles, this would be helpful if you turn to these passages. Um, unless you're listening online, driving your car, or not, or podcast, then just listen. But if you're in the room here or online, if you look at, with me at Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. And the book of Leviticus, we're, we're given a lot of rules and regulations here. And Leviticus 24, 16, it says, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord, and Lord is in capitals there in many English translations, and I mentioned to you that when you see the word Lord in all caps, that means it's the proper name of God. It's the name Yahweh. Um, we don't know how they pronounced it, but it's the, the letters Y-H-W-H, Y-H-W-H. We don't know what, vowels, what the vowels were because the, the Jews didn't put in the vowels. They just had the consonants. But we pronounce it Yahweh, but that's God's personal name, which comes from a Hebrew. It's related to the Hebrew verb, which means to be or I am. So when God says, I am who I am, um, that's the name Yahweh. And so in your Bibles, for the English reader, anytime they have God's personal name, at least in the New American Standard and other translations, they put Lord in all caps. And if it says Lord God, and the God is in all caps, then it's saying Lord Yahweh, the God is Yahweh. So that, that's free. So here, the one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh. And name, as I mentioned before, refers to character. You're blaspheming the character of God, shall surely be put to death. Okay, so let me ask you, does the Bible say you should put to death people who blaspheme God's name? Absolutely, the Bible says that. Okay, and if you look at <clears throat> the words, you're going to discover, yeah, uh, death means death. And, you know, if you look at the immediate context, you're going to see, well, yeah, it fits there and, and uh, fits with, with the book. But you need to understand the Bible context, which we'll get to in a moment. But... Do we practice this? Do we practice verse 16? Have you ever seen anybody practice this? Well, if you see any Christians practice this verse. Okay, Muslims practice this verse. You know, um, in some ways, you know, maybe not Yahweh's name, but. Okay, so if your friend says, well, I thought you believed the Bible, so you just pick and choose what you're going to believe. Why don't you do this? And if you don't know the answer to that, yeah, you need to know the answer. Why don't you do that? We're going to give you the answer tonight. But first, let's give you another one. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, as I mentioned before, is a Greek word, which means the second law. It's the second time God is giving his laws because the generation that refused to go into the promised land died out after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And so you have a new generation, so he has to give the law again. So you read Deuteronomy, you go, haven't I read this before, like in Exodus and Leviticus? Yeah, you read it before. But Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, he's giving the law. God's giving it to him. And he says in verse 5, A woman shall not wear man's clothing. Okay, um, some of you women have pants on tonight. Maybe all of you do. Hmm. Yeah, how about that? A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall man put on woman's clothing. Oh, well, let's see. Any men got dresses on? Not sure. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. There's the word Yahweh again to Yahweh your God. So let me ask you, why don't we follow this? Now, when I was growing up, I went to churches to follow this. This is why women were not allowed to wear pants in church. And some, most of you are too young to remember those days, but I remember those days where women could not wear pants in church um, because those are men's clothing. And so if this is true, why don't we follow this? It's in the Bible. Why do we pick and choose? Okay, here's another one. Back up one page. Oh, uh, oh, wait, no, let's go to verse 11 there. Chapter 22, verse 11. You shall not wear a material mixed of wool and linen together. 
So if you have a sweater or an outfit that has a little bit of wool in it and something else, you're violating the scripture. Why do you do that? Back up one page uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 21, begin in verse 18, 21, 18. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them, then his father and mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gateway of his hometown, and they shall say to the elders of his, of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men in the city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from the midst, and all Israel shall hear of it and fear. Now, don't tell me how many times you wanted to do this, <laughs> but we don't do this. And the question is, why don't we? Is it in the Bible? Yes. Is it God's law? Yes. Did God say it? Yes. Is it God's will for these people to do it? Yes. So why don't we do it? Do you want to know the answer, or should we just move on? Yeah, okay, I heard someone online say yes, okay. Yeah, let, let's find out. Um, so, it's important to us, for us to understand that God had different rules and different regulations for different periods of time. And let me just give you, um, give you some other examples, they're not in your notes, but Adam and Eve... What did they eat? Yeah, they're vegetarians. And if you want the text, it's Genesis 129. Adam and Eve were vegetarians. Noah, after the flood, what did he eat? Anything. Anything in there, everything. Genesis 9.3, all animals, everything. Then Moses came along in Leviticus 11. And what, did, what was Moses told? Well, yeah, don't eat pork, don't eat shrimp, don't eat geckos. That's on there, you know? <laughs> um, and so they had limited what they could eat. And so no longer could they eat all meat. And then Christ comes, and in Acts 10, 13 to 16, he makes all animals legit again. Bacon's back on the menu, you know, and so is shrimp. And then when we get to the kingdom period, we have Revelation 5, 10 to 14, we have animals surrounding the throne singing, holy, 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 praising God. I don't think we're going to be eating animals then. It's hard to eat a talking animal. <laughs> okay, I don't know what we're going to eat. So we see that throughout the scriptures, God has different rules for different periods of time. Right? And all you have to do is look at the dietary laws to know that. But there are other things. Um, in Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is writing in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He says in verse 9, He, God, made known to us the mystery of His will. Now, a mystery in the Scripture is not a whodunit. A mystery is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but now is being revealed in the New Testament. That's a mystery. How do we know that? Because Paul's defines it that way. He gives us those examples. He tells us they didn't know this in the Old Testament. Now they know it in the New Testament. And there are a number of things that they didn't know that we know, and Paul uses this word. And he says, He, God, made, to us the, made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him and Jesus. With the key to, and the next word is important, an administration uh, the King James says dispensation, right there, that word administration or dispensation, suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. So he's saying there's going to be a future period, administration or dispensation that's different than now, where everything's summed up in Christ. Well, this word is used elsewhere in Scripture. It's the Greek word, and again, I have to write in Greek first. Um, it's the Greek word, I'm not write in English. <laughs> I can't spell it in English. You know, let me make it bigger. It 
It's word economia. Economia is a word that's used there. Economia. Um, can you think of any English word that sounds like? Okay, economy. We get our word economy. Economy is just a transliteration of the Greek. It means you take the Greek word and you just pronounce it in English with English letters. You don't translate it, you just transliterate it. Well, economia is a Greek word that comes from two Greek words. The first word, um, you have yogurt that you call maybe oikos, the Greeks would pronounce it ekos, but if you get that Greek yogurt oikos or ekos, that means house. That word means house. And the other word, nomia, comes from the Greek word for nomos, which means law or rules. So there are different house rules for different houses. And dispensations or administrations or economias in Scripture are periods of time, houses, so to speak, that have different rules for that period of time. So that an example would be, I go to your house and maybe your rule is you can leave your shoes on in the house, okay? You're from the mainland, you're used to leaving shoes on, and so you leave your shoes on the house. You come to my house, you take your shoes off. And that's the rule, we have different rules. Your house might have different rules for the kids. The kids are allowed to not, the kids are not allowed to talk back, you know, or sass their parents. You go to someone else's house, they have different rules. So throughout the scripture, there are different houses with different rules. And so when you read the scripture, you gotta know what house you're in. And so if you're in one house, and in that house they stone rebellious kids, <laughs> you want to make sure which house you're in and what one you're part of. And these are called, um, they're called administrations. In, but because the, because the uh, King James is from 1611, we've adopted the King James English translation of this word, which is the word dispensations. So, dispensations is a, is a great word, but some people don't believe in what I'm going to tell you tonight. I'm going to show you there's two schools of thought on how to view the Bible and history. One is called dispensationalism, and the other one is called covenant theology. And so your, your inserts that I gave you tonight, those two extra pages, help you understand the two differences of those systems. And what you'll find is the covenant theologians use literal interpretation plus allegory. The dispensationalists use a literal interpretation. If you use strictly a literal interpretation of the scripture, you have to be a dispensationalist. Both groups will agree to that. There's no, you know, that's not an argument. It's like, if you take the Bible literally, you'll end up being a dispensationalist. Um, but those who like to add allegory to interpreting, especially the prophecies is where they use the allegory of spiritualism. Um, that's covenant theology that uses that. And we do a comparison on the sheet that I gave you there. Um, there's a real colorful chart there with the blues and the greens and the yellows. And I didn't write that chart. Um, it's online. It's available. A student of theology wrote that. I wouldn't take it 100% correct. Um, it's a student who wrote what his professor said and he put in a chart. But I highlighted in yellow the key differences between a covenant theologian who uses allegory in his interpretation and a dispensationalist who sticks with a little method of interpretation. And the one big difference, um, one of the biggest differences has to do with Israel and the church. And covenant theology believes that the church replaces Israel. And dispensationalism believes that all the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament are still going to be fulfilled literally to the nation of Israel. So that's a key watershed thing of how you view the nation of Israel. Uh, and, and so you can see the chart there. I tried to pick someone who was unbiased. The problem is, you know, if you ask a Democrat what the Republicans believe, or if you ask a Republican what the Democrats believe, it's kind of biased. And so I tried to find someone who's a libertarian to tell us, you know, <laughs> what the liberty, what the, the two thing, that kind of thing. So I think this chart is fairly unbiased. Um, and then the next page after that, it says gotquestions.org, and it looks like this. And that is written by someone who is a dispensationalist. He's telling you what dispensationalism is. 
And at the very, I highlighted the key things. At the very bottom, he says this on page 23. He says, to summarize, dispensationalism, now keep in word, keep in mind, dispensationalism comes from the word economia. It's in the Bible. It's used there in Ephesians 1 in the very way that we're using it here, and it's used elsewhere in Scripture. So, to summarize, dispensationalism is a theological system that emphasizes the literal interpretation of Bible prophecy. And that's the key, which Bible prophecy and how you interpret it, whether literal or literal plus allegory. It recognizes a distinction between Israel and the church. Covenant theology would say um, the church is in the Old Testament. Dispensationists will say, no, the church is not in the Old Testament. It was born at Pentecost. God has a separate plan for Israel and the church. That's dispensationalism. And it organizes the Bible into different dispensations or administrations. So the Bible can be seen in different administrations, the dispensations. And that's what we're looking at now when we come to these scripture verses that I mentioned about stoning someone who blasphemies, not wearing men's or women's clothing, not wearing clothing mixed with wool and linen, or stoning a rebellious child. These are in a different dispensation. We don't live in that dispensation or that administration or that economy or that economia or that house law. Those all mean the same thing. We live in different ones. And in the scriptures, the easiest way to kind of look at it, like how many dispensations are there? Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say, but you know for sure, absolutely sure, there are at least three. You know that there's a period of time in the Old Testament where we have the law, the Mosaic law. That's a different way of doing things. And those are the laws that we were reading about stoning people. That's the Mosaic law. This is Moses' house. And we don't live in Moses' house. I'm glad we don't. And then we have the New Testament, and that's a period of grace. We live in the period of grace. And this is Christ's house, and Christ has certain rules for his house that are different than Moses' house. And you and I live in that house. But there's going to come a time where we're going to, li we're going to live in the kingdom period. And we don't live in the kingdom period right now, but that's going to be in the future. And so these three periods are very clearly distinguished in Scripture. You go, yeah, but what about the people before Moses? What about Adam and Eve? Well, that's why people have a dispensation of innocence when they were innocent. And then, well, what about Noah? And what about Abraham? Because they all lived before Moses. So you could have different houses with different rules. And that's explained in your charts and in the handouts. We're not going to go into that, to that tonight. But I, what I want you to understand is when you read the Bible, you need to know the context of the Bible where you're reading. So let me give you um, another example. Look at Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9. And even though this is in the Old Testament... It's talking about the kingdom period. It's talking about when Christ is reigning on earth during the thousand-year millennial kingdom period. And he says in verse 6 of Isaiah 11, And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf of the young lion and the fatling together, and the little boy will lead them. He says during the millennial period, the kingdom period, the animals will be like they were during the time of Adam and Eve. We're going to get along with the animals. And you can go up to a, a lion and a tiger and a panther and go, here, kitty, 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 you know, and, and they can sit on your lap if you've got a big enough lap, you know, and they'll purr, and they're not going to eat you. In verse 7, and also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, so they're not carnivores again, just like the time before um, Adam and Eve sinned. The animals didn't eat meat either. Nobody ate meat. It's going back to that period. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child and put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord 
as the waters cover the sea. Well, that time hasn't happened yet. And so your choice is you either take that literally, like a dispensationalist does, or you have to allegorize it like a covenant theologian would. So a covenant theologian would look at that and would not take it literally. What would they take it? I don't know. I'm not a covenant theologian, so you have to ask them. But I would take it literally. It's a literal event that's going to happen, that's prophesied, but it's in the kingdom period. So when you read the scriptures, just because you're reading in the Old Testament, you might have something that's talked about that's going to happen in the New Testament or in the kingdom period. So you have to do your work to know what you're talking about. And so this is where Christians get in trouble, that they go to the Old Testament and pick a verse. Let's say it was popular to pick a verse in the Old Testament about homosexuality to prove that that the church is getting homosexuality. Well, then someone who was smarter than that Christian would say, well, you hold to that verse, but why don't you stone your rebellious child? And the Christian goes, well, I don't know. Ask my pastor. (laughs) Okay? So you have to understand what house you're in. Now, it's important to understand. Let me ask you. The Ten Commandments. Which house are they in? Not a trick question. Where, where, where were they given? Exodus 20, right? They were given to Moses' house, the Ten Commandments, right? So then you say, well, do we keep the Ten Commandments? You know, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't murder somebody, don't covet your neighbor's wife. They sound like good things. Don't worship any other gods. So you think, wow, now I'm confused. Those laws are in Moses' house. They sound like things that should be in Christ's house, but we don't want the ones about stoning rebellious kids, so can we just pick the ones we want? No. So what's the answer? It's a very simple answer, really. But you have to know the answer, or it's confusing. This is Moses' house. This is Christ's house. And for those listening on the podcast, I'm drawing two big circles, and they intersect each other and overlap. And where they intersect and overlap, right here, they have some of the same rules. And some of the same rules, where they overlap, guess which ones those are? The Ten Commandments. Some people want to say only nine of them are mentioned in the New Testament, not all ten. But if you go to the New Testament, you'll, men- you'll see the Ten Commandments taught in the New Testament under Christ's house. I would contend that all ten are there. Um, some people want to leave out the Sabbath and say it's not part. But you need to understand the Sabbath, according to the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath keeping is a creation law. It existed before the Ten Commandments. It started when God created the earth, the Sabbath law that we are to keep the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is not about going to church. The Sabbath is about rest. And the human body needs to rest every once, every seven days. We need it. And if we don't, we wear out faster and die and things like that. So Christ's house, Moses' house, they overlap. Ten commandments are in that part that overlap. So some things that are rules in the Old Testament are rules in the New Testament. So same thing like you go to my house, I might have a rule that um, you pray before you eat. And I go to your house, and guess what? You pray before you eat, even though you leave your shoes on. You know? So we have different rules, but some of the rules are the same. So that's how we understand the Bible context. So you have just gone through a one-year course in about 15 minutes. And that's why I gave you the two handouts. Um, You'll have more detail there. And if you want to do even more research on your own, you can just Google it. But remember, you're going to find it very biased. You know, when you have the Democrat describing the Republican, the Republican describing the Democrat, it's biased. But just read them and just kind of figure it out. Okay, now we come to the fifth context. And the fifth one is the historical slash cultural context. Historical slash cultural context. And you're going to see, you need 
a lot of the information to understand the Bible correctly. Because you go, well, I don't know the historical context when it was written. I don't know the culture there. Well, if you don't, you're going to make some mistakes. Let me give you uh, a common mistake made in Revelation chapter 3, 15 and 16. I've heard it, I think I could say every time I've heard this passage preached, unless, <laughs> unless I was listening to a sermon that I preached, and it's not that it means that I'm right, it just means that most people get it wrong. Proverbs, I mean, I am right, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, but I wasn't right until someone pointed me out, because, pointed this out to me, because I was wrong, because I didn't understand the cultural historical context of Revelation 3, 15, and 16. But once you understand it, it makes sense. God's writing to churches that were existing in John's day, literal churches that existed, and they were in the area of Asia Minor that we call Turkey. And he writes to a church in Laodicea, which is in modern-day Turkey, and he says in verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And when I, I heard this sermon not too long ago on a sermon uh, on the radio, pastor's preaching, and I, if you didn't have masks on and we weren't on the film, I'd, I'd ask you to, a question, but I'll just ask it and answer it myself for sake of time and hearing. But when people preach this, how do they preach it? They say, God wants you hot, and God wants you cold, but he doesn't want you lukewarm. And the way they interpret it, he wants you hot, on fire for Jesus. You know, wow, let's go get Jesus, or cold for Jesus. Like, oh, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. He'd rather have you not want anything to do with Jesus than be lukewarm, be a Christian that is kind of average. And that's how you hear this preached. And I've heard that since I was a kid, and I go, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. And I'll tell you one reason it makes sense, because your average Christian is lukewarm, according to that definition. I mean, most Christians are not, woo-hoo, 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 you know? Um, and so it didn't make sense. So then someone said to me, and you need to remember this because it will change a lot of things you view. This is a metaphor. Duh. You can't read in a 21st century metaphor back into the first century. You have to know what they meant by the metaphor. What did they mean by hot and cold? We mean Mahat is a metaphor, meaning, you know, you're, you're on fire. That's a metaphor, you know, that you're really for something. You have a lot of energy. Cold, like I said, means you're staying away from it. You don't want anything to do with it. That's not what they meant. And if you've ever been to Laodicea, I've been there twice now. Um, Laodicea was a town that didn't have its own water source. And so they had to pipe in water. And they piped in spring water from a neighboring town. And they also are near a place that I've been that has hot springs that go down limestone stairs like that. Beautiful, it looks like Yellowstone. And they piped in this scalding hot water. And you can go there today, and I've seen them. The aqueducts still exist today. Not the whole way, they're broken up, but some of them are open aqueducts, troughs, and some of them are clay pipes. They still exist today from the time of the Romans. And they would bring the water in from high up in the mountains where there was hot spring water and bring it to Laodicea, and they would bring this ice-cold spring water into their town. Both are good. When they read this, hot is good and cold is good. Some people like hot tea when it's cold out. And some people like really cold iced tea when it's hot out. But very few people want their drink lukewarm. A cold drink should be cold and a hot drink should be hot. And when you understand that, it changes the whole meaning. And he's saying to them, you're being contaminated by your environment. Because when hot water is contaminated by its environment, it becomes lukewarm. When cold water is contaminated by its environment, it becomes lukewarm. And he says, you people have become lukewarm. You're not the kind of people you should be. Cold is good. Hot is good. Lukewarm, not so good. 
because you've been influenced by your environment and it's changed what I've made you to be. Well, that makes a lot more sense to me. Doesn't that make more sense? Is that the right interpretation? Well, I don't know for sure, but it fits the historical cultural context because you can't read a 21st metaphor back into the first century. By the way, we do that with the word head. We talk about husband being the head of the wife. Is he the head of wife? Absolutely. Ephesians tells us the head of wife. But head's a metaphor. So you need to understand what head meant in the first century. When we say head, we instantly think boss. He's the head of a, of a company. He's the boss. Okay? He's the head of the tribe. He's the boss. Those are all metaphors. He's the head of the family. He's the boss. Is that what the New Testament meant? Eh, You've got to figure it out for yourself. It's a metaphor. You can't read it in. So I'll, I'll give you a hint, though that head in first century could mean source, not just boss. Like we have head of a river is the source of the river. And when Jesus is the head of the church, it makes more sense that um, he's not saying I'm the boss. I'm the source of what the church needs. Forgiveness, love, grace, mercy, salvation. And so if head means source, the husband as a source over the wife, is he's providing the love in the family, and she responds to it. And that's why he tells a husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. But we're getting off here, but I'm just showing you how it's important to study words and to know them in their historical and cultural context. Okay, so we have these different contexts. We have words, we have the immediate context, we have the book context, we have the Bible context, which has to do with the dispensations, Old Testament, New Testament, kingdom, and things like that. And then we have the historical, cultural context. How do you find these things out? Well, in my day, you had to buy a book. And you got a Bible encyclopedia, you know, and your Bible encyclopedia, if you want to spend money, it could be a six-volume set or so, or it could be a one-volume set, and it would give you the cultural aspects of things. And today, you can go online and just Google, you know, Laodicea, <laughs> boom, you know, and find out about it. So you have a lot of resources. I also mentioned last week the... the Blue Letter Bible. I think I called it the Blue Letter Study Bible, but it's actually the Blue Letter Bible. And that's an app, and you can get, and it helps you do word studies and, and things like that you can get. So a lot of this you can do online. Okay, the last thing tonight we're going to cover briefly. The last thing is uh, a course. It could take a whole s- semester. But after you've done this, um, there are three mandatory steps when you're trying to understand a passage of Scripture. And the first one is you need to observe and ask yourself, what do I see? What do I see? And so too many people read a verse and they go, huh, what does this mean to me? Well, you're going to find out that that's the last step in a minute. You don't read a verse and say, what does this mean to me? You first have to see, what does the verse say? What's there? Look at it. Read it again. Read it in a couple other translations. Read it backwards. One of the most helpful things for me is to write it. Write the verse, and when you write it, you go, oh, I didn't see that, and I didn't notice that, and you write it out. Then interpret, after you've observed what's there, you need to interpret, and you ask yourself, what does it mean? What does this mean? And you have to understand it in its, the words, you have to understand the immediate context, you have to understand the book context, the Bible context, the historical cultural context. You're not going to understand what this passage means unless you understand those things. You need to understand them as best as you can. Now, you can get a good study Bible. Uh, Life Application Bible, that's a good study Bible. Uh, the Ryrie Study Bible is, is a good one, but it's kind of almost too succinct. Um, there's, I haven't ever looked at it, John MacArthur Study Bible. There's other study Bibles out there, and they will help you understand cultural context, historical context. They'll give you little notes after a scripture. But remember, the notes are not inspired. They're, they're a person's opinion. It might be a correct opinion, but it'll help you know more. Um, so a good study Bible is really helpful with notes in it and maps and things like that. And again, you can look online and, and find out ones that are available and get ideas of ones that people recommend. And the third thing you need to do, once you understand the Scripture, you have to apply it. And you have to ask yourself, what does it mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to me? me, not just what does it mean. And that's why when I preach a sermon, I don't just give you 20 to 30 minutes of information and then at the end say, now how does this apply to you? That's how I was taught to preach. That's how I was raised. You got all this information for 20, 30 minutes. And then they say, how does this apply to you? Well, 
The whole thing ought to be application. So that's when I preach a sermon, every point has an application. So when you fall asleep after point one and miss points two and three, you still got some application to go on. I want to make sure you got application all the way through the sermon. And when you're reading the scriptures, the goal isn't to get more and more information. It's to get information that's going to change your life. Because remember, we're trying to go from the mind of God to the mind and actions of you as the reader. So we don't want to just have all this information. We want it to change our lives. And that's why I find it really helpful. I like to journal what I've read because then I know I've applied it. I read some scripture and then I back off, think about what it means, and then I, I write the verse in my journal and then I say, what does this mean to me? What is this really telling me to do? How is my life going to be different because of what I just read? And I was reading the book of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel t was told by God that um, the death of his wife would be a sign to the nation of Israel, that they're going to lose everything and, and mourn. And uh, so Ezekiel gets up, and he, God told him that, and, and goes, in the evening, my wife died. You go, wow. And God said, and I don't want you to mourn, I don't want you to cry. And I thought, oh, well, how does that apply to me? I don't even have a wife, <laughs> you know. But you think about that and think, the cost he was willing to pay to be obedient to God and do what God wanted him to do was incredible, the cost he would pay. And so I look at my, my notes and my journal, and I think, how does this apply to me? And so every scripture, as you read it, you should be looking at, how is this going to apply to me? Does that make sense? So now, just because God told Ezekiel that doesn't mean he's telling me that. So he's not telling me that my wife's going to die. Don't hijack someone else's curse or someone else's blessing. A lot of people do that. They claim blessings in the Old Testament that aren't for them, that are for the nation of Israel. Or, well, if you're claiming the blessings, why don't you also claim the curses? You know? So make sure when you're reading the Scripture, you're claiming what God is saying to you, not to someone else. Okay, we're going to stop there. And like I said, you have those two additional pages that will kind of help you. And then after those two pages, you have a, a story, which is a great story, about how the scriptures can transform a life. And, you know, I'm not going to read it to you tonight. Normally I would, but um, on page 24, it's a story about Harry Ironside, who was a preacher, and he was challenged by an atheist to debate him. And he talks about how the scriptures can change a life. And he said, if you can find one atheist who can stand up and say, ever since I became an atheist, I quit alcoholism. My marriage is better. My life has come together. He goes, you find one person like that, and I'll find whatever, hundreds who will tell you once they came to Christ, their life was better. And the atheist couldn't, you know, obviously find one person who could say their life was better because they came to know Christ. But it just talks about the power of God's word to transform a life. And it's just really a great story. So read that. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, let's pray, and we'll close there. And then if you want to ask me some questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who communicates, and a God who communicates well, and a God who communicates clearly. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to listen well and to then follow well the things you communicate to us. Lord, help us to be great students of your word. And we're so grateful that you've given us this word, Lord Jesus. We love you, and we praise you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.